The presidency has asserted that, like former President Goodluck Jonathan, Nigerians would yearn for President Muhammad Buhari after he leaves office. The senior special assistant on media and publicity, Garba Shehu, decried the high level of criticism heaped on Buhari, noting that Nigerian leaders are not loved while in office. Meanwhile, Adewale Adebayo, the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, SDP, has said Bola Ahmed Tinubu won the presidential election because he had the most experienced politicians in the polity supporting him, even as he dismisses the petitions challenging Tinubu's election at the tribunal. According to him, he has learned his lessons, but like Judas, who betrayed Jesus, there are lots of pretenses in politics. Now, should Nigerians expect a decline or progress in the quality of governance? Time will tell. Joining us tonight to discuss is uh, Prince Adeole Adebayo. He's a presidential candidate of a social democratic party. Now, in today's interview, Adebayo is saying that Asiwaju Bola Met Tinubu won the presidential election because he had the most experienced politicians in, his, in the polity supporting him, even as he dismisses the petitions challenging Tinubu's election at the tribunal. According to him, he has learned his lessons, but like Judas, who betrayed Jesus, there are a lot of pretenses in politics. Should Nigerians expect a decline in the quality of governance if Buhari claims... Uh, are interpreted superficially, well, time will tell. Joining us tonight to discuss this and many more uh, is Adewale Adebayo, Prince Adewale Adebayo. He's the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening. Good evening. Um, a lot of things have been going on um, since after February 25. Um, a lot of people are still feeling like they, their votes didn't count, especially those who um, felt like there was a lot of voter suppression. There are those who also think that they need to go to court to challenge this election. Um, and then there are those who are, are celebrating that their man won, even though yesterday I, I did have a conversation with somebody uh, from the PDP who said that he doubts that um, the swearing-in will take place. And... Um, this is also some of the sentiments that other people, you know, share. But I want to take your thoughts from back uh, to February 25, where we had the first election, the presidential elections, and then, of course, the governorship elections. What did you make of everything that happened, especially with the situation with INEC? Well, what I saw was that we always have opportunities as a people. Uh, we tend to assume that that opportunity automatically will make itself realized. Uh, so the February 25 election, the first thing that struck me was the low turnout. Because prior to that, we had uh, about 80 something million people with their PVCs. And if, if you take mortality into it, maybe you could expect more than 300,000 to be either sick or diseased or something. So when I saw the turnout, I was, I was kind of, I found that that was problematic. Mm. After the accreditation, I saw that uh, because the, I alone thought that I would bring out not less than half of the entirety of the people who came out. And so, and when it comes to the issue of accreditation, there's no dispute. Mm. Nobody is complaining yet that there was anybody uh, who was to be accredited and who, who, who was supposed to be accredited and who was not accredited. No. Mm -hmm. Majority, 99.9999% of those who came out to be accredited were accredited. And it happened simultaneously. You, were, you got accredited and you voted. Yes, uh, but, then, but then people were still saying with all of the uh, level of awareness, like you said, you expected mm -hmm. that half of the people that came up would come up for you. But then we still saw a low turnout on the election day. That's what I'm saying, that I was expecting a turnout of about uh, 50 some, 55 million. Uh, I was expecting more, but because of that Naira swap and all that nonsense about Naira changing the color of money and all of that, I thought people were already reporting that it was difficult. Even I was in the last two weeks of my campaign, mm. I was just barely 
coping. Mm. But I was expecting that, okay, with that, you have like 50 something million people. Then when I saw that uh, we had less than half of that, we had about 20 something million people, I became a little apprehensive because, and then when I went to places where I voted and I started doing exit polls, I noticed that it was the traditional voters that came out. Even with all that we did. Yes, and the traditional voters are not our voters mm. because they are already used to the, the system. system of voting. Many of them belong to the particular political parties. Uh, many of them had the incentive that will bring them to vote regularly. Uh, you come out, you get something, you get out. So the, the new people, uh, we didn't see much of that. And uh, in, in fact, one third of those who came to vote were also voters that came institutionally. Mm. Either they came through the church mm. or through other uh, social groups like that. So I noticed that uh, the turnout was... was what amazing. exactly do you think is respons was responsible for that? Because many would call it voter suppression. Many others would say it's still apathy that you know, has been waiting in the wings. Because we saw an increase in voter registration, new entrants, which brought some level of excitement, if not for you, several other politicians, including uh, the likes of Peter Obi um, and several other people who are newbies at this particular presidential um, you know, um, election. What do you think was at the core of that drastic reduction, even after we saw that level of registration and the new entrants? Okay, we need to be data-driven because there are a lot of assumptions. You know, when you are campaigning, you say something, whether it's true or not, once people repeat it online and it becomes news. Well, actually, the majority of the voters were not new voters. We only had 13 million out of the 85 being new people. Mm -hmm. So all the months of voter registration that we did only brought additional 12 million people. So the people were there already. So, so let's just do that. Mm -hmm. And from what I see, out of the 12 million additional voters, I don't think we got more than 3 million coming out. Hmm. So the traditional people still came out. So I'm still asking, why do you think that with all the stress that people went through to yeah. register and get their PVCs, yes. we saw people go back over and over again. Some slept at mm. you know, local government headquarters to get mm. their PVCs. Why would they not come out on election day? Well, I've, I, I have a feeling that one, the number of people sleeping, good, all of that together is not up to 2 million. So that's it. it's just to crunch numbers so you understand that. Secondly, is that there are many motives for collecting these PVCs. Hmm. Some will collect because you go to a church and the pastor says, if you don't have a PVC, no, no sacrament. Uh, pressure. Uh, you also know that some are coming of age. That will be the first document they will have. Hmm to show that they are adults, so photos, photos card. Mm. Some will collect it to go to use it for ATM and uh, bank transactions. So many reasons. Mm. So they were potential voters. But until you show up to vote on that day, you are not uh, a voter until you come out to accredit and vote. Second reason is that I was telling the media that by not opening up and allowing diversity and variety of opinion uh, in the campaign by focusing on a few, you are not, there will be many people who will not find from the so-called four people you are projecting that they, that they like. So that is why you have more vo voter turnout when you have more variety mm. of people. Thirdly, when I went around uh, the country, I found out that the media is not that penetrative. Social media even less. So you go to places like Newman, you go to places like um, many parts of um, Adamawa State, many parts of Taraba State, uh, entire land of um, Brono, and you mention people's name that they don't know. Hmm. So and very few places where you go and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I watch you on TV. They usually like, okay, yes, oh, it's, it's, so you are running for something, okay. Uh, yeah, what's your name, by the way? And uh, things like that, even close to the election. Mm. And then when you mention other people, I remember when um, uh, Engineer um, Musa Konkwaso, Rabbi Musa Konkwaso and I met in, uh, in uh, Taraba. That was a week before the election. We met at a radio station, and we started comparing notes. 
we discovered that people were calling in to say, where have you dudes been? You know, okay, I mean, what you're saying makes sense to us. So we realized that with all the fame and um, pageantry going on in, uh, in the major cities and online and all, people in the hinterland were still waiting for their president. Hmm. So I think that showed, I mean, that's one of the lessons I've learned that uh, maybe you do more of uh, grassroots work. Don't assume that um, I mean, people are following. It's not so. And if you look at TV shows, look at other things, you get two million people. It's, some of them are repeat viewers and many of so that is a major issue and then uh, fourthly the crisis of the money was an issue because i for example i remember a place like uh, quara north where we were massively popular and when i saw the result from there that was like what happened and actually they said look majority of the people who were to vote had not even eaten no money to buy food and that the few that they saw who came out were people they could lift, you yeah. know, to the polling unit because someone who had uh, two, uh, three children at home uh, had no money in their pockets, nothing is working, they are all hungry. The little money he has is not going to jump on a bike to come and vote. They will just say, you know what, you guys are ruining it, so good luck to you guys. So do you think, um, sincerely, that the, the, the cash crunch, the money... Uh, situation with the CBN governor um, achieved its purpose or was it um, an exercise in futility? Well, to say it's an exercise in futility but it's also an exercise in stupidity because why I say so is that it is the objective set officially cannot be achieved by the method because the objective they set was that the, the money had expired, so they needed to rec recall the money. Mm -hmm. Two, they wanted to use, manage the money in such a way that it would not uh, uh, be used for criminality, like paying ransom. Uh, th uh, three, the money in circulation was much more than the money that was in the banking. None of these things will address it. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any sense. That's why I, I used the expression. But... It's been reversed now, and I think they've learned the lesson. So when you want to achieve any of this, there is an afterthought, which was now made it completely meaningless. The afterthought was that if they withdrew everybody's money, then those who had the intention to bribe or collect bribe would not have any money to use. <laughs> I think that it turned out that it's not so, that you made people more desperate, you made people more desperate, to now be in a situation where they needed help, which made them more vulnerable. Yeah. Secondly, bribery... But could that have been the plan the whole time? No, I don't think so, because what I see is that everybody became partisan towards the end. Everybody was trying to put his hand in the, in the game, somehow. So you find that people who are in the media were supposed to be objective, some are joint, joint camp. Uh, people in uh, um, pro pro professions in the government who are supposed to just manage their business. Uh, what concerns the governor of the central bank with an election year? Except if he has macroeconomic or microeconomic implications. Otherwise, what's your business? You leave that to the politicians. So everybody puts their hand in it. So that was the, where the problem is. Look at religious institutions. You just want a righteous person to come and rule. You're not supposed to take side. So everybody was traditional rulers, whatever. So people became frenzied, and everybody started putting their hand in it. That was the problem. So in that situation, and bribery under our law, bribery is not only money. It's anything of value. Hmm. So you can bribe a minister with bag of rice. So the fact that you say that you withdraw money, you, all the other things of value, and that's what happened. People now became desperate. Uh, a lot of incompetence went into even withdrawal of the money. So people started collecting homo, uh, uh, water, whatever. So these are all the problems we need to learn so that next time we are trying uh, to engineer a democratic process, we, are, we should know that it's an opportunity to renew your choices of leadership and to improve on the quality of the people you bring. 
And to do that, you have to increase the quality of understanding that the voters have. Mm. So you, those are the things you do. And to do that, you have to open up everything. Don't be worried. Those who are teleguiding and thinking of walking towards an answer, they realize that it, it didn't work. So that was why there is nothing I'm saying now that I didn't say why the policy was on. So you won't say, oh, it's, it's but hot because he lost an election, so he's coming out to talk. No, I could predict that if the media re remained biased like this, if every institution that should be neutral wasn't neutral, if the government was making erratic policies like this, you would not necessarily get the results you want. But you will also make sure that the people of Nigeria somehow don't feel happy about mm -hmm. the outcome. Many, many pundits um, before this election, I mean, I mean, people had propounded all kinds of theories. Mostly people were saying that this, was a what, this, was, this election was going to be a watershed moment for the country. Um, this was going to be a make or break election. I mean, we, we hear these things every time mm -hmm. we get close to an election year, but many really hoped that something would change. Did you think that anything changed in our electoral process? Well, some things change. For example, I mean, not, you can't change more than you change your mind. Mm. If Nigerians don't change their minds, the country will not change. So you are still voting based on religion, voting based on ethnicity, be, voting based on people who give you gifts. And all that. So what will change? If you don't change, there's nothing will change. But one thing is clear that, and I said in one of the statements that I made, President Buhari did something that was good. He's the least partisan of any president who has presided over elections. How so? It's the only one, it's the one I have seen where you cannot particularly point out that he was directing INEC what to do, uh, directing police to harass anybody, uh, harassing DSS or anything like that. And so he wasn't um, doing do or die. So, and he wasn't in doubt that he didn't want to leave. Prior to that, we had president that didn't want to leave, that we were in doubt whether they were going to leave at all. So, in his own case, there was no doubt that he was going to leave. Secondly, anybody who did well or didn't do well cannot point out and say it was Buhari that didn't make me do well. You can point to any other person. But, 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 then, but then you can't also you know, not leave this at the feet of Mr. President. The President did promise us that INEC was going to be free, fair, and credible in their elections. He was going to make sure that he left a legacy of you know, credible elections. Can we really say these elections were credible? Looking at all of the things that emanated in different parts of the country, and of course the situation with the um, uploading of results with, I mean, we even saw what happened in Adamawa State recently. With all of this, what, what legacy that is, is Mr. President? His own legacy is his own problem. But what I can tell well, but you he is he did that make a promise. No, he did his own part. In the sense that, one, he's not going to go and run INEC. So it's not a case of not releasing money to INEC. It's not a case of not appointing commissioners. It's not a case of interfering in INEC. You, you get the point I'm making. So you can't blame him for the misbehavior of professors who were hired by INEC, not recommended by him to INEC. You can't blame him for the behavior of voters who came to sell their vote. You can't blame him for the behavior of politicians who tried to cheat. You can't blame him for the incompetence of one or two people in INEC because he's not, they are not under supervision. They are in, supposed to be independent in their operation. So he's not responsible for I that. Like, I like the fact that you said suppose because the word suppose there means that they're, they're, they're to be independent, but they're not. Yeah, they are not independent. And then they're again, just, the bulk stops again at Mr. President's no, table no, because we, these people are people that... Who, who appointed the man who sits at no, the helm no, of affairs that, at INEC? No, if, Who's he answerable to? No, of course, the people and Mr. President, no, right? The, the INEC, INEC chairman. How independent is INEC? No, as independent as the conscience of the person who is there. Okay. The process by which INEC chairman and United commissioners are appointed is the same process as the Chief Justice of Nigeria is appointed. So if you are going to an independent office where by law, you are self-regulating. You need to make sure you select people who have that discipline. Secondly, you need to know that if INEC makes five mistakes, two can be out of incompetence, three may be out of leaning in favor of one person or the other. Two out of those three that relate to leaning in favor of people will be leaning in favor of politicians. So the president might not be the most influential person on INEC. You will find out 
that our attitude as a country, and I've seen it in many institutions, I said it even when we were doing the Peace Committee, which was independent of government. You will see that even in simple things like seat assignment, to sit in alphabetical order, people will still read the sitting arrangement. People generally do this, it's a cultural problem. So I'm not a spokesperson for Buhari, and I wish him luck as he's going back to his village. But what I can tell you is that the role which he can play, and relative to, and compared to the role other presidents have played before, has been that he has managed to live an INEC with his own conscience, whether they have bad conscience or otherwise he's left them with their conscience. He has not impeded them in any way, and he has not dictated an outcome for them. However, People are not satisfied with the end of the result for three reasons. I am not satisfied for reasons which I have given, uh, which, has, which started far before the election, and I've been complaining over time. Others are not satisfied because they were in a cocoon and assumed that they are the only one who are on the field. Mm. So if you are in that echo chamber and you keep repeating yourself, you will have seen the crisis that will have followed if, say, Tunubu had lost. Because people in his echo chamber, thought that uh, nobody would even come near, and that Peter Abbey was a clown, and that people like us, were, we, 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 we lost our mind, and uh, um, uh, Tiku would be nowhere. So everybody has their own permutation. And uh, when I met people who were in PDP, they told me, just don't waste your time. We have it covered. So that's the second set of people. The third set of people are those who are objective analysts. They look at the ideal of what INEC promised. And there was a case of overpromise on behalf of INEC. And many of those things that INEC promised were things, one, that are not real, two, that are not even within their control, three, that they had not inculcated in the culture of their own staff. So when, so when I run a factory and I tell you that we will deliver your goods on time and everything, I should be saying so on the strength that I have competent people, professional people, who are going to follow my regulation. And from what you saw in uh, Adamawa, you will see that when I said al much earlier, after the election, that INEC has a lot of um, incompetent and dishonest people. They thought that I was just being abusive. But when you saw what that wreck did, you will see that INEC now admitted that they had a resident electoral commissioner who was not loyal to them, who was not following the rules, and who was working in the interest of somebody outside INEC. Imagine if he had not been brazen enough for him to come out and say the illegal thing that he said openly. Suppose he was doing it underneath. Mm. And those were the problems that INEC was having. Many of the, and in Adamawa state, it doesn't still mean that the result announced is correct. It's just that INEC people divided themselves into two. One set was working for APC. The one set, the other set was working for And do for you know this PDP. how? I know this because I had candidates in the, in the, in the, I had Dr. Uma Ado. I had a candidate that my party was sponsoring, that I was supporting, and I had gone to Adamawa to work with. And, and he told you this on I, what? I am following the situation. I know what was happening. I know when they were changing results and doing everything. What I'm saying to you is that INEC needs to be honest with itself. Just like what INEC is angry about is that this wreck, wrecked everything openly. But they had been managing crises in different states ahead. Mm. And they managing particularly in that state. That was why they had to stop the election, go and redo it, and so many things. And when they go to the tribunal, you will learn more. And I'm not saying this as a person who is angry because my candidate lost. I'm saying this because you are interrogating me on the, in front of the public to tell the public what is wrong with our election. So I can tell you categorically that in Adamawa State, go there and do any research, ask anybody, not less than half of those votes were bought with cash, bought with these, also cases of violence, all sorts of things. So these are not things which you can expect uh, Buhari to micromanage. He, can, he barely can manage the villa uh, successfully. So he will now go and start micromanaging INEC. What do, you, what do you mean by he can barely manage the villa? Because he set certain goals for himself. When he came, he didn't succeed in most of them. And whose fault is that? You see, those are his faults because those are directly under him. Mm -hmm. So that's why I will not blame him for things that are not dying. He is the commander in chief of the armed forces, for example. So failures, people being kidnapped, people being killed. As we speak to you, now people are being killed. Those things he's responsible for. Mm. I'm not going to hold him responsible for managing INEC 
which is supposed to be independent. It's just to nominate them, fund them, and leave them in peace. But the one he's directing every day that is responsible for, let us take, tackle those. He hasn't done much with employment. He had eight years, eight budgets. He didn't reduce employment. He didn't handle that correctly. He has not been able to manage the currency to create some stability, not even parity. He didn't successfully do that. He did some work on uh, road works, civil works, and all yeah. of that. So we can give him credit for a bit of that, but he, he, that's the highest point he can, he can say he has, which is infrastructure. What about corruption? And he, he will score like maybe 38% in that one. What about corruption? Something that he, he abandoned corruption. He abandoned corruption long ago. He, he gave up. Why do you think he gave up? He gave up because, one, is the people inside his government are so corrupt that he, don't, he didn't show the courage that he needed to just fire all of them, most of them. I, I, I'm curious. The reason why I'm going to ask this question yes. is because it took six months. I mean, we all were here when it took six months for the president to pick people who he was going to fit into his cabinet. And yes. he said, I might not quote him exactly, that he was looking for men and women that had some level of, you know, right standing, for the want of a better way to describe it. Men and women who had um, no dirt, no skeletons in their cupboard. And you're telling me, sitting there, that there are so many corrupt people in Mr. President's ca cabinet. I'm not the one telling you. Just read newspapers, read cases, listen to EFCC, listen to everybody, listen to the general report. Then even the Auditor General himself is missing because he was, uh, uh, Accountant General has already taken a lot of money. So what I'm letting you know is I have a lot of likeness and liking for President, um, President Buhari. I don't have any problem with him at all. What I can let you know is that he failed. And if you bring honest people into the room, you cannot recognize them. So all these people he said was good, those are all species I believe they were written for him because he has opportunity. Even the least performing minister, he couldn't fire them, couldn't do anything. So I think as he's leaving now, the lesson to learn from it is that until a person has thought through what he wants to do, being foisted with power, where you have not envisioned what you want to do, would always lead to wasted years. The, I'm sorry, Mr. President tried to run for this office over and over again, four times. What do you mean? I mean, he could have had, I mean, I'm sure he had time, enough time to think about what he was the going to do. The signs were there. This is why, I'm guessing that this is why he wanted to be president. I don't think he just wanted to be president for the fun or, or just having his name written as commander-in-chief. That, that's what it turned out to be. But in the course of running, you will listen, right? Nigerians, we have one issue. We tend to ignore what people say, what they do, how they respond to questions when they are running. We help them to cover up. So we create heroes when people are running for office. And then people who come out and start to explain what they will do. We say, ah, well, they're just talking, just talking. So the issue is that I listened to President Buhari, what he said by himself. I knew that he would not do too well because of the fact that desires and wishes are different from you understanding. And while he sat down on that throne, we were understanding the problems more than him. We were interpreting the problems more than him. So to the end, what, what we owe him now is just a blissful retirement and hope that the next person who is coming will not fall into the same uh, uh, oblivion where you are sitting down there and people are whispering to you what to say, you don't know what you are going to say. Um, you just announce people's name. You cannot control them. You cannot follow them. You are not receiving data. You are not reacting to data. Those are the problems. I think President Buhari became president 30 years behind time. <laughs> uh, he's, he's passed the, his prime at the time. And I think he alluded to it. He had a lot of frustration himself. I believe that when he settles down, he starts talking, you will see that he too had a lot of frustration. But I saw capacity problem. I saw the problem, the gap of when he was ill, that gap was there. I have a problem of the infighting with his team, everybody doing whatever they like. He didn't have a complete team that he's put together. And uh, also, it, it was too slow. Uh, the majority of the people in, alive today were not born when he was president last time. So mm -hmm. he's not used to the country. He's not used to the new issues. Uh, Fast-paced governance 
I think he couldn't cope with it. But he turned out to be a man who loved the country, but I don't think he knew how to do the job. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, I guess the question is, what is uh, the, you know, a good, in, I mean, if you have the best interest of people, but you don't have the willpower, uh, then it doesn't mean anything. You need willpower, you need competencies. You also need uh, ability to adapt. Mm. So that when you make mistakes, you don't, however good you are, when you start operationalizing your governance, you will make mistakes. Obviously. But your ability to admit that you have made mistakes, even if you don't admit in public, but your subsequent conduct. Look at the way he performed in Adamawa. He, did, he acted quickly. In, in, in the previous government, once the REC announced it, there's nothing you will do. You mm. go to corporate. In this case, he, the, the INEC stepped in. When INEC reported to him, he also put the person on suspension. All government agencies immediately two on the side of INEC. So, if he was re responding to every crisis that came his way like that, he would adapt. Mm. But he didn't, but good luck to him. He's done his best. And when somebody says, I've done my best, you have to let them go. Because mm. only they know their best. It was that we know that the best is not good enough for us. Well, we'll take a break. And when we come back, we still have Prince Adewale Adebayo in the studio. We'll be looking at uh, the swearing in and what happens right after that. Stay with us. It's still Plus Politics.